Hello everybody, this is Andre. Welcome to the Marketing Innovation Show. On today's episode, we have a very special guest and old friend. Uh, his name is Alan Gleason, and he's one of the most recognized B2B SaaS marketing consultants and specialists in the UK. Hi, Alan. How's everything going? Hi, Andre. Good to connect again and delighted to get to talk to you after so long. So all going well here in London. Very, very delighted as well. It's been, it's been quite a while, no? <laughs> Tell my hair has got quite a lot longer since we last spoke, and I don't quite have the sharp, sharp jackets um, with the pocket uh, handkerchiefs that you used to have as well. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's before COVID. So uh, I think there's going to be before COVID and after COVID. But uh, all is well, and, and delighted to hear about your kind of ongoing success. So great to reconnect with you. Yeah, same here. And uh, I know you have some very, very interesting and uh, insightful success, success stories that we'll uh, discuss in this episode today. So really, really excited to, to make a start. Um, super. So uh, for our listeners today, uh, guys, so Alan has been involved with growing um, from a marketing perspective, multiple startups in the UK, but not only. Uh, so his expertise is international and global. He's been contributing contributing to successfully sell uh, to the successful sale of multiple uh, SaaS and software businesses uh, so some of the uh, Alan tell us about <laughs> some of the recent success stories because you just mentioned them and I was like wow yeah so I'm working at the moment with a company called Indemo in Cork in Ireland who are a very kind of strong fast growing startup very very interesting space called mobile ethnography so I think there's a big future for those you and I both work together at Cognizant, uh, which is probably the fastest growing SaaS startup in the UK. So again, we can share some stories on that later. Mm-hmm. Um, I've recently been involved with a company called Keelvar, another company in Ireland, um, who just raised 18 million in Series A. So that's a very exciting kind of part of their journey. Um, I also help American companies looking to break into Europe and similarly some European companies looking to expand into the US. So um, a crew would have been one that I worked with last year, which you may be familiar with as well, which was acquired by Integrate. So a lot of my clients are sort of around this Series A sweet spot. Some of them are kind of pre-Series A, some are post-Series A, but uh, they're all very interesting in their own way. And I'm very fortunate to be working with such great people. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So yeah, indeed, we, we met um, in the early days of uh, Cognizant. So before there, um, I mean, about a year and a half ago. And uh, yeah, we, we had the opportunity of working uh, a lot on um, on that business as well. And I know that you were helping them expand their strategy in the US. So for our listeners here, guys, um, what we'll discuss today is we'll have a more strategic episode. So we'll look at marketing strategy for this specific niche and we'll look at um, you know what you need to do if you are a startup in this space and you want to grow in the current market. So obviously we had some... Um, some things that were shifting or changes during this COVID time. Uh, some businesses or some investors tend to be more uh, careful with how they invest their budgets. And then we, we need to look as a business at how to build that brand power and to build an inbound marketing channel to drive leads and conversions. So Alan, Alan is a specialist in this and uh, he has a lot of success stories to back that up. Um, and I really think we're going to have a, a very insightful episode for everybody that is looking, is activating or in this niche or is looking to get into this niche at this, uh, at this point in time. So um, I guess the niche, Andre, for your listeners is B2B SaaS. I mean, that's kind of the area that we're in, right? And, uh, I think, Andre, kind of key theme today, and, and again, we share some ideas on it, is are you pre-product market fit or are you post-product market fit? So that is a really crucial distinction. And uh, essentially what often happens is everybody wants to be post-product market fit because they want to go and they want to tell prospective investors we've got product market fit. Mm-hmm. They want to really accelerate the growth, but often what happens is that they're not really at product market fit. Um, and then the big problem is, is that if you decide that actually you are at product market fit and you're not, you start looking at things like growth hacking and lead generation and inbounds and putting cash into the, into the kind of pipeline when you're not there. So you're essentially wasting a lot of that money. Um, so I guess that's one of the key themes Andre, I don't know if you had any experience with that, but there's a great article by Tom Tungus, who's a leading US VC. And again, we can kind of share it in the notes afterwards, um, Andre. But he talks a lot about the biggest mishire in SaaS startups is they hire a kind of a marketeer focused on growth when they should be hiring someone focused on product market. Mm-hmm. And essentially trying to scale prematurely 
means you're burning cash and burning spend on paid acquisition in particular, when actually the pre-product market fit piece is more about research. It's talking to customers. It's talking to prospects. Um, it's almost like an academic exercise. So again, I thought that's worth kind of sharing right at the start because that distinction really, really is crucial. Mm -hmm. Understood. So uh, basically what you mean by this is that if uh, you haven't really generated a lot of sales yet and you don't have that, uh, you know, like that product market fit, essentially is um, investing a lot more time and resources into validating your product pricing, uh, brand strategy and so on before. That, that's exactly it. You, you're spot on. And skills are very, very different. There's no point coming in and hiring someone. And I see job posts with companies that are very young, looking for growth hackers, growth marketeers, head of demand gen. And actually, they're not at product market fit. And I think if you've got an initial cohort of customers, you have to take out your friends, anybody that you've signed up for free because they're a friend, and you don't count those. Mm-hmm. If, you're, if your um, kind of clients are in lots of different countries and lots of different industries, you know, you might have got lucky with a few. You may not have, um, like ideally, you've got one small vertical where you've got a concentration of 20 or 30 that, are, that you're really meeting a need for and you can understand their pain, you can understand their challenges, and then you can really take the learning to make sure that your pricing is good, your positioning is good, your feature set is good, um, before you go and start then trying to spend money buying traffic and buying leads. Because Mm -hmm. what often happens is people skip that step. Because of course you want to hire someone that's investing in growth and generating leads, but if you skip the kind of really crucial customer engagement, market research, product market piece, you know, you are then going to spend, you know, a lot of cash figuring out and trying to understand why you're not converting. And I, I guess the simple way of thinking about it, Andre, is, um, you know, I mean, product market fit is, is kind of an ill-defined concept. And again, I have a blog, which I will share and you can put in the notes that sort of helps tease out a little bit what it is. You know, revenue and cash is, is kind of the key piece, right? I mean, if you don't have a lot of um, people that are using your product and sticking around, you probably don't have mark product market fit. I mean, you see product market fit when you're in clients where you're spending three or four or five K a month on, on acquisition and you're getting decent inbounds that are real good quality. It could be 20, it could be 50 or 100. You probably don't have product market fit if you're also spending three, five K and you're only getting two or three or five coming in and they're in different industries and in different sectors. You know, they're a bit more, um, there's a lack of a pattern. So I'm laboring the point a little bit, Andre, but I think it's a crucial distinction because, again, for B2B SaaS startups, you know, uh, you will really suffer if you rush to spending money on people for lead gen and putting money into kind of different channels. Uh, you just won't get the payoff until you're kind of closer to the to, to your product market fit. But, but I'd love your thoughts, Andre. Do, do you agree, disagree? Where, where's your view on it? Yeah, I, uh, I think it's very true. And just for our listeners to be very clear, so if uh, uh, if you guys have a startup, I think that, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that um, look at the your, your current spending and look at the leads and try to audit the kind of leads that you get from which sectors, etc. And if uh, the acquisition of, for example, in a specific niche of uh, which your product can deliver towards uh, seems to be not so strong or your leads seem to be frankly random in the way that they come through, then this probably means you have to go back a bit at your branding and at the values and your product itself and look at how to better tailor your offering towards the market that you are most interested in uh, before exactly. scaling exactly. your budgets. That's exactly it. And you've got to go narrow. It's counterintuitive, but you've got to go into a niche. Like I was with a client recently and they said, oh, it's no wonderful. We've got some clients in fast-moving consumer goods and some in financial services and some in insurance. And I tried to explore in a bit more detail and there's two or three in each bucket and two or three in telecoms. And there's a phrase, horizontal markets are brutal. They are because if you are in marketing, you know, you don't, you know which one of these do you focus your attention on? You, you can't have the same messaging. There'll be different requirements for these different, different niches. So you, you need to be really narrow. It's counterintuitive. You've got to be as narrow and focused. Can you really fix the pain that a small concentration of vertical has because if you do that you essentially get product market fit within that category and you can expand from there but you can then quickly realize you know the personas what do the ideal customer profiles look like 
a publication should be, should be focused on. What are the keywords set? Um, otherwise, you, you know, it's back to this kind of crucial piece. If you think you're at product market fit prematurely and you get it wrong, you're going to burn a lot of cash because, of course, with SaaS, the sales and marketing costs are largely up front and you're hoping to obviously generate income into the future. But that whole model is very fraught with risk. If you don't get this product market fit piece right, you will end up, again, as I mentioned, putting cash in prematurely, burning through it. And it frankly makes it very difficult for someone in marketing because, you know, how can they be expected to know all these different verticals? Who are the main thought leaders in these verticals? Who are the main journalists? What are the main publications? What are the industry bodies? You know, do they read LinkedIn? Do they not read LinkedIn? What are the keywords? So again, that's kind of the key message here, Andre, has been really fixated at this front piece. And why am I laboring the point here? Because it gets back to strategy. And strategy in a B2B SaaS startup is challenging because you're resource constrained. Again, I'm assuming you're in Europe. I'm assuming um, fairly modest um, resources. So therefore, you know, you've got to kind of get the strategy piece. And, you know, you may have a junior marketing person that's just not capable of setting the strategy. The strategy might need to come from the CEO. But ideally, it's driven by data from the existing sales. It's mm-hmm. not conjecture. It's not wishful thinking. It's a ruthless interrogation of what have we won so far? Where have we won it? And okay, which of these little pockets looks like they're the most attractive in terms of market size and opportunity? I'm going to talk a little bit more to these few verticals um, learn what I can, and then really target those to then propel me to the point where I have sufficient cash flow to be looking at other areas. Mm-hmm. Um, and from your work, because I was uh, also thinking about some of our recent um, uh, co- collaborations, ongoing collaborations, some of them are startups in uh, East Europe uh, that are looking to expand into Central Europe now. So we help them with building the sort of inbound uh, strategy as well as customer acquisition. Um, they're also um, looking for investments. So um, from your exp- experience, how how is that discussion carried when, um, you know, like maybe you have a very passionate founder and they have a core team and they are, you know, they think they got it right. Maybe they are uh, pitching for investment as well. Um, and they think they have the strategy all set up and all, all they need to do is acquire new clients. How would you carry that discussion or how do you approach the situation where you know that is a need for strategic um like for a reframing of the of the strategic approach, uh, but maybe they are not willing to look at that anymore, or they are not willing to invest resources anymore in strategy, but because they might think that they have that product market fit already there from a couple of collaborations. Yeah. So what I'm kind of picking up from the question was, I guess, if they're looking to raise, you know, how can they kind of close the gap with the kind of um, kind of strategy piece? So so making some assumptions. So there's a huge difference between um, US, Western Europe, and then sort of Eastern Europe, for want of a better phrase, right? So, you know, states, there's typically five or 10x the raise. In, in other words, seed level and series A, they typically have a lot more cash in the tank, which means it's a completely different landscape, right? So they've also got a 300 million body domestic market in the US, right? So when you, when you are launching, so a lot of the stuff we read has got a very US kind of tint to it, right? And the point is they're coming from kind of resource abundance, whereas, you know, Western Europe and further kind of East is even is what I call resource scarcity. And the other thing is, is VCs are often, you know, more comfortable being concentrated around areas where they're geographically pretty close to their, their, to their portfolio. So you've seen that in California, you've seen London and Berlin and Ireland to a lesser extent, whereby, you know, the VCs probably want FaceTime COVID, you know, withstanding, but they, they, they kind of there's enough deal flow and pipeline in their local areas to say, actually, um, you, you know, we're, we're happy kind of with, with, the, with the talent pool and the lead flow in, in, our, in our areas. So the further away from that you go, the harder the, transa- the, the harder the transaction costs, the more uncertainty. But it's back to a kind of a key piece here, Andre, is that numbers kind of trump everything, right? And by that I mean, you know, if you've got a good grasp of your unit economics and your unit economics means that you've got real clarity as to who your customers are, you demonstrate that, it, that you can acquire them in meaningful numbers, you understand your cost of acquisition, you understand the lifetime value, you understand the, the monthly and annual recurring revenue. 
you know, so, so that's your kind of key, really. You know, if you've got compelling data, um, you know, that makes people sit up and stand up and take notice. It cuts through, it cuts through the noise. So it's kind of chicken and egg. So, so ideally where you probably want to get to is, Kind of get the post, get get to post product market fit, bootstrapped if you can, but get to the point where um, you know you're, you're you're dealing with decent numbers, and then then you become someone that cannot be ignored, right? So Ahrefs would be an example. I think you're familiar with those guys, and of course, and again, I actually don't know their private equity or VC funding or whatever or not, but but their guys have technical expertise. Remind me, do you know where they're based or where they were founded? Mm, I don't remember, but we do use their service, so yeah. <laughs> we are customers. Yeah, yeah. No, so they're great, and um, so, so they're just a, a great example of not being London or, 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 or San Francisco and kind of building a great product. Mm-hmm. I don't know, does that answer it, Andre, the question? No, it does, and um, from here, because, okay, let's say we have the product market fit, and we, go, we went through all this journey of rediscovering our brand, maybe looking again at our customer profile. Uh, we have the niche, we have everything. Um, now, there's a lot of tech out there, uh, and we know that for B2B, uh, lead generation is very essential, and then there's a lot of tools and, yeah, tools and channels that can help this process of generating leads. Um, let's start with the channels. What are the channels that you think um, a startup in this space should uh, look at attacking um, as a must in the beginning? So obviously it depends on the resources that they have, but what are some challenges that you wouldn't leave out in the beginning? Yeah, and look, I think, I think the key piece here, which is what you've mentioned, is resources, right? So, so like, and it comes into the tech stack as well. You know, like if you have a junior marketing person that's pretty young, pretty inexperienced, right, and has minimal budget, um, you, you know, that's the context. There's no point trying to layer on huge amounts of extra resources and tools and platforms because it's not going to work, right? It, you know, you, you, you can't be really layering up, you know, the expectation of Legion if there isn't a large enough kind of body of people or the skill in-house. Now, of course, you can support that and supplement it with people like yourself, right, where you're getting access to external um, resource, and I think that's something that's very, very useful in the early days. Um, for me, the kind of three probably ones to look at are outbound is one, right? So again, and Cognizum obviously is a tool we're both familiar with, but you know, if you really understand, you know, you've mentioned you've got product market fit, you really understand your ideal customer profile or your persona, which is essentially who has got the pain that you can fix. Well, then, you know, you can start targeting those with outbound um, if you know the title of the individual, if you know the industry sectors that you're in, that they're in, if you know the pain well enough that you can write compelling how-to guides to fix their pain, um, you know, you can then start targeting them very effectively using outbound way more effectively than you, than you could have done historically. Again, outbound will give you mixed results because if you don't really know your ideal customer profile, if you don't have a strong value proposition, if you don't have a great landing page, you know, uh, you can come unstuck pretty quickly and you'll be saying, Alan, why did you say outbound? You know, it's not the right one for us. It didn't work. Well, it's a very powerful tool. If you know your ideal customer profile, if you've got a compelling value proposition, if you've got a strong landing page, you know, if you've got good English writing in there. Um, so that, that's kind of outbound. Google ads is obviously another one, but again, Back to my earlier point, you can really burn budget very quickly if you're trying to advertise to everyone in every country. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, Google is essentially a monopoly player in, in many markets, right? So the cost of acquisition can be very, very high, but you know, um, it is a tool where you've got search intent. So people are searching for keywords and you may have a solution for those keywords. So it is something in, you, you've got to use, um, um, but it comes with a big health warning because it can burn spend pretty quickly, you know, and it's very, very complicated AdWords, right? Again, you might need to outsource it. Why? Because platform is a bit of a beast. And if you've got only a couple of people in your team and they're trying to do a hundred things, they can never give it the due attention that it deserves. So things like attribution and tracking and optimizing keywords. So, so, so that's the second one. And then the third one is probably LinkedIn. Again, I'm assuming B2B SaaS, but 
you know, you need to try and generate some awareness that you exist. So again, the beauty of LinkedIn is that you can get access to your ideal customer profiles and you can kind of promote your brand to them probably through sponsored content or downloaded white papers. And look, it's not the same as Google Ads. It's not giving you the same sort of level of MQLs, but it is probably assisting it by helping you raise awareness. The problem with it is essentially a monopoly product as well. And unfortunately, the cost is just prohibitive for many. And it's extreme because, um, you know, those tools, Google Ads and LinkedIn, are often where many startups' budgets go. And, you know, it's just frustrating that they are both um, lacking major competition so they can essentially name their own price, which pushes up your cost of acquisition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very insightful. Um, and going back to the pricing issue, because uh, again, uh, as you mentioned, America and uh, the Western Europe uh, market as well, they are both fairly expensive when it comes to any sort of uh, like Google um, and LinkedIn equally. Um, did you find any good examples or were you a part of projects that had a... Um, an innovative approach to building their inbound channel strategy? Like maybe they did something out of the ordinary, ordinary or they had some growth hacking tactic that, that generated them a lot of um, qualified leads? It's a great question. You're putting me on the spot here, right? Because I'd be more, I'm a more traditionalist marketing person, right? So I think growth hacking is an interesting concept that's probably, uh, it suggests that there's almost silver bullets, right? And, and of course, um, what often happens with growth hacking approaches is they quickly um, get found out and everyone copies them and then the advantage is gone. <laughs> no, yeah, they're they not growth hacking anymore. <laughs> so, 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 so there's no doubt that there is, um, you, know, you know, that there is. Uh, uh, and the other thing, right, is that like it's very hard. And again, there's a big kind of caveat with lots of my advice is that B2B SaaS is so individual to your company because there's so many variables, you know, variables between Europe versus states, where your market is located, um, things like how much budget you have, what's the team size, you know, how competitive the target market you're going after is, whether you're kind of creating a category or whether a category exists. So it's a very, very hard to kind of share stories. I mean, I guess you do see some interesting ideas, right? So um, outreaching to people, looking for them for quotes so that they can be in a, in a publication, um, that, that's a good idea. Webinars like this, where you're trying to invite people to share expertise, which are creating valuable content, which then can be um, used to market effectively, is good. Um, you know, you, I'm going to push it to you in a second, so get ready, right? Because this is more your territory. So, um, I, I think um, you, you know, you can look at key. You know, you can look at if you go to tools like Uber Suggest or Ahref or SEMrush, you can find the keywords that your competitors are using to bring traffic to their site. And you can essentially hijack those. And what you will find in many instances, the most of them are using their brand, you know, to bring traffic. That's where the bulk of their traffic will come from. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you can put Google ads against why we're better than X. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I don't have any standout examples. I think um, I, I've seen quite a few over the years, which, I, which have all been eroded quite quickly. Um, I don't know. Have, have you seen anything uh, of late that you think is a really good one to explore? Um, actually, uh, this goes. Uh, uh, this basically confirms very much of my uh, hypothesis when it comes to B two B SaaS, uh, because uh, software. I think in software is much harder to come up with growth hacking ideas than it is for uh, consumer goods uh, or for things that can go viral. Um, I know that uh, one thing that I noticed on LinkedIn was the guys at Turtle. Uh, I don't exactly remember what they did, but uh, when they launched, and I know that we were discussing about them at, the po at that point, uh, assessing whether they were a viable solution for one of the projects that we were working on. Um, they did something at an exposition, I think it was, um, where they generated some uh, fun content. I think it was, I think the, their team was out, outside uh, generating some um, engagement offline. And then yeah. uh, they transposed that, uh, those movies and sort of engagement um, online as well. So that thing, um, managed to get a lot of uh, attention to them on LinkedIn. And then obviously I assume, I'm not very sure, but I assume that that translated a lot into sales conversations as well. And the key point is here, we, we don't know, right? But like, like you can generate lots of noise, but if it's not your kind of persona, target personas, and, and that's the key piece, you, making that distinction. So, you know, I have a client that recently was starting off on webinars and they kind of had a celebrity 
on one of their first webinars. And of course, the number of signups was through the roof. But there was very poor conversion subsequently, um, which I anticipated, which I'd explained to them and said, look, it's great for brand awareness. But the reality here is this person is attracting a completely different audience to the audience that we really need and um, the audience that we've got, you know, so it's back to kind of really understanding the pain of your target audience. How big a pain is it? How frequent is the pain? The old methodology, which is called jobs to be done from Clayton Christensen is one that I hold, you know, um, as a key kind of way to, to look at the world is what are people currently doing? Are they using spreadsheets or documents to manage whatever you're trying to fix for? And then, um, you, you know, really trying to help these people, offering them value. And, and the old adage goes, if you, you know, if you view it as trying to educate and help rather than to sell, you'll be in a much better position. What you want to do is try and make the person that you're targeting, how do you get them promoted? Well, if you view it through that lens, that means your incentives are quite aligned. So mm -hmm. if you can make them look better, if you can improve their ability to do their job, if you can make them save money, or if you can drive revenue for them, or if you can lower their costs. Mm -hmm. um, so be really aligned with understanding, and this is back to the real start of the conversation where we talked about product market fit and understanding these different personas um, and their pain and their challenges, then you can really craft content and solutions. And, and again, to your point, I don't think you can really grow that too easily in B2B SaaS. The reality is it's a fairly dry, sort of predictable process whereby you're offering value um, in, in white papers and, and, and case studies and you're demonstrating you've got a mix of call to actions on your site. You're offering people choice. So when they do need to kind of make a decision, they can get a demo or a discovery call pretty quickly and, and really understand what it meets your needs. And you're also helping them to educate earlier on in the journey. So I think it's kind of very um, staid compared to some of the growth hacking stuff you'd see in B2C world. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something really uh, good as a transition to my next question. So you mentioned uh, crafting content and understanding your um, target persona so that you can craft marketing content to uh, deliver towards their objectives or uh, sort of their desires. And I think that gets us very nicely into the, um, another subject that I wanted to discuss with you because I know this is very much uh, your cup of coffee and something that you specialize in um, is aligning marketing and sales and making sure that in B2B, the two go together. So let, let's start with your thoughts on it. Uh, what do you think um, are the things that maybe our listeners can look at in the beginning to assess whether these are aligned in their organizations and then how can they start building from there? Yeah, look, it's a great question. And I've, I've had a couple of examples and I, I, I won't betray any confidence with the names, right? But uh, I had one instance where a head of sales um, and I was a head of marketing at the time in the same firm. We were geographically remote, so we were in different offices, but he hired something like five um, uh, business development people after a Series A raise without sort of flagging with marketing function. And all of a sudden, uh, of course, you've got uh, these guys starting on and girls starting on a Monday morning and there's no leads because there hasn't been any communication with marketing, right? So um, so I think there needs to be strong dialogue, right? Because the reality is, is that marketing in many instances is so busy, they're a step removed from the customer, yeah? The step mm -hmm. removed from the ideal customer profile because most marketing functions in Europe are resource constrained, they're suffering from resource scarcity. There's a, too few people trying to do too much. You know, uh, you know, again, the key, you know, the key skill for anybody in marketing is prioritization because you're, you know, you're in B2B SaaS, you're dealing with so much coming at you, right? So, so, you know, and this is back to the kind of earlier points around product market versus lead gen. So, so you can get disconnected very quickly. So, you know, what, what, I, what I see working very effectively is, um, you know, being really clear with sales that like you guys are talking to people on a regular basis. So what language are they using? You know, are they using the same language to describe the solution set that we're using? Because from a keyword point of view, um, you know, you want to zone in on what are the kind of most compelling keywords that describe your service so that you can then own them and sort of create a category around them. But, you know, are, are people in the front line using that same language? What are the biggest headaches they're talking about? You know, what, what is the language you're hearing? So there's a couple of ways you can do it. So a few things that you can look at doing is having Slack channels whereby sales and marketing are in the same channel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, salespeople are, are, are feeding, you know, ideas into that. That can also help shape editorial calendars. So with one of my clients, we're very fleet of foot around content. It's a very changing and evolving landscape, particularly with COVID. So 
you know, we are literally shaping our editorial calendar based on things they're picking up from sales calls. So if a couple of concepts keep coming up that hadn't been noticed for the last few weeks, we will then, particularly over, you know, objections. So if someone's objecting, you know, in a sales call, oh, but wouldn't it be great if it did this, or I'm not sure how it stacks up against that, then, you know, putting real how-to content in um, that addresses, addresses that is a very, very kind of sharp and smart thing to do. Um, so there are some of the ideas. So, so a long-winded answer, um, but, you know, they need to be kind of joined at the hip. Um, and things like, you know, you know, the dialogue around the MQL and SQL quality. So for me, an SQL can only happen when a salesperson has spoken to someone and validated that they have a need, they have budget, they're a decision maker or a main player, and then have a willingness or need to, to kind of purchase. And, you know, there needs to be a dialogue back to, 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 to marketing, you know, that bunch of MQLs, um, uh, you know, is good or bad, or these verticals are better, or the sales cycle with this cohort is particularly long. So there's got to be this feedback loop that helps market, um, you know, marketing market more effectively, which comes to mind. My next challenge, which is which often rears its ugly head, um, is attribution, right? So attribution yes. can be hard, right? Where particularly, you know, it's great if you're um, and often U.S. companies again. Sorry, all my friends in the states, but. You know, it's easy to have attribution if you've got 10 or 20 people in marketing and one or two dedicated to it and you've got um, the latest technologies and you're running lead forensics and you're, you're, you're running um, marketing automation tools and you've got plenty of people to create lots of content so you can feed the engine, but it's very difficult in Europe in, in a more resource-constrained context. So attribution can be very hard, Andre, whereby that bit is the bit you can often try and, you know, try and push sales really hard you know, when they close a sale, you know, not when they have a conversation, when they close a sale, is it really clear in the CRM what the initial source of that lead was? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's not, there needs to be an investigation to go back and try and understand, was it Google Ads initially brought the person? Was it LinkedIn? Was it where them out referral? But that piece of data really is the most important piece of data to help fuel further marketing efforts. Very, very good uh, and broad answer as well. I think he touched on a lot of uh, the questions that I was going to go into. Um, I think one one thing that is different from the UK market specifically, um, and I think it should be understood better by the East European market, is the importance of tracking because it happened that more times it happened than the times it didn't happen that the end client was interested in just like generating those leads or those sales without actually wanting to know the channels that were performing best. They were only interested in having a system that works. So that was their, uh, you know, like end goal, which is fair from a business perspective. Like, you know, a CEO would want just the revenue growth. Uh, but I, I think that in the UK, the approach to generating that revenue growth, which is understanding which channels specifically work best and then what type of content so that everybody in the company is aligned to the type of communication that needs to happen uh, at any point in the sale, whether that's, you know, like first contact marketing or sales or even a discussion with somebody else from CS, uh, customer success. Um, that's not happening too much in Central and East Europe as far as our experience uh, was. And I think that this is a very important point that you guys listening, if you are, um, maybe if you fall under this segment that maybe you are not looking very deeply at understanding what works for you in terms of channels or in terms of content distributed on specific channels, um, maybe it's the right time for you to go and to talk to your marketing guy or your marketing agency and really analyze in depth and seeing uh, what you were doing before that was uh, working well and why, and then how maybe you can uh, double down on those specific maybe two channels rather than spreading, spreading your efforts on six channels at once so that you can generate scalable results. Exactly right. So, so like, you, you, you know, and, and like I've seen this play out so many times. So let me paint a picture. So you've got a couple of people in marketing, you know, they're working hard. Um, CEO looks around the corner and says, hey, Alan, we'd be great if you could do a webinar in two weeks' time for us, right? And, uh, and I say, yeah, sure, boss. Um, and, and then, like I tell all my clients, they got to run toggle or a free time tracking because what invariably I know as well, why are they trying to do the webinar? Is it because their friends are doing one? Okay. And what will often happen is, you know, it could take 40 hours of work 
right? Because, you know, if you build it, they don't necessarily come. So you've got to promote it to an audience. You've got to make sure people are signing up. You've got to all do all that thing. And I had an example. I knew this was going to play out. And I said, look, I, I don't think this is a good idea because if the goal is to drive leads, back to the point, I'm not sure this is the best use of time with scarce resource. So lo and behold, what happens is the web webinar gets run. Um, you know, a lot of time sunk into it. I think over 40 hours between a couple of people. Um, and, you know, it went successfully in terms of people showed up and enjoyed the content. But did it generate any high quality MQLs? I think it generated maybe one. Um, and, and then the kind of, and this is back to the attribution piece. So when it came to next month's webinar, well, I'm kind of saying to the guy, well, hold on a second. You need to communicate back to your CEO. Fine. You know, just so you know, you know, if we do outbound activity, it usually brings us in 10 MQLs for um, about a quarter of the price and about a quarter of the time. And I don't know the exact figures, but, but the point is, is that, you know, it's a really kind of good representation of the kind of scenario that plays out. And if you don't have attribution, what's happened here is webinars then become a monthly occurrence mm -hmm. that have been landed onto the top of the marketing function that's already busy. And it becomes almost a vanity project because it gets the, you know, it's, it's not really bringing in leads, but it's now become a habit and it becomes, um, right? So, so this is why the attribution piece is really key. And of course, I'm not going to get into multi-touch attribution and, and kind of there could be different channels, obviously, um, you contribute to a lead, but you really need to be fixated on trying to understand when a sale is closed and you either ask them nicely, just out of curiosity, how did you hear about us? And make sure that's captured in, in a field in the CRM, not in notes anywhere. It's got to be in a field that when you interrogate at the end of the month, where did all these sales come from? You can start seeing patterns because going back to where you want to grow, a resource constrained function needs focus. So they're going to need data on which to make these decisions. So ideally what you're going to come back and say is, well, why don't we reallocate those hours and that spend into this channel because that's working more effectively based on sales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, very insightful, Alan. Thanks a lot for this. So um, now going back to the tech stack and to some uh, tech PCs that you think are good quality nowadays and, I, and you think that would be useful for, for a startup in this space, what categories of uh, tech would you be looking at? at? Maybe some reference names that, can, that people can go and check out outside of this episode? Yeah, that sounds great. So Toggle is a free time tracking app. I think it's really important to track your time so you know how much of your time you're spending on different activities. So then you can kind of communicate effectively with the C-suite and explain this is the time that you're taking up. A tool for prioritization. So Teamwork, or Basecamp or Trello, take a look at any of those three. I think they're really good. You do need to prioritize because you're going to get things coming at you from all angles. And um, make sure you're running Google Search Console. Very important. Not everybody goes and gets their site index. It's got to be the HTTPS version. Go get indexed on that. Um, I uh, really like tools like um, Uber Suggest, which is a free version, or Ahref or ICMrush. Um, again, you can probably subscribe to them for a couple of weeks if you need to, so you can do really good keyword research. Um, a couple of others that I think are quite useful. So I do use Grammarly to check my content. Again, for many of your audience, people that are not native English speakers, app.grammarly.com. I don't download it to my computer because it slows anything down, everything down. So just run it through your browser would be would be kind of one that I recommend. Um, Zapier is a great tool for kind of pushing um, leads, you know, into Slack or into your CRM. And again, you know, I steer away from things like automation too early because you can't have too much tech stack. If you layer too much on top of a small team, excuse me they won't um, be able to function. I won't be able to um, you know, manage everything. So other ones are things like Lead Forensics, I think as, as, as a good name, um, as being something, it's not something I've used currently, but um, again, for the right context, seems to be a good tool for people that are at our stage. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the CRMs, uh, what have you, because this is a discussion again that is um, often carried out um, in the context of a startup when they try to implement a CRM and get everything more organized. Um, what are some CRMs that you uh, liked in the projects that you were involved with? Yeah, look, it's a great question. Like a lot of CRMs, right, have um, largely similar um, functions at this stage. They tend to have, um, uh, you know, by and large, a similar kind of set of things to do. 
their UI and UX is key, right? So it's a case of kind of looking at a few different ones and seeing which UI and UX thing, and, and also the integration. So does it integrate with, you know, your site easily? And um, Close is one that I'm using at the moment. Um, I've used Salesforce at previous companies. I think it's a bit of a, a beast for, for mm-hmm. a lot of these startups. So I think it, I, I would kind of defer using that to further downstream. Um, there, look, there's a lot out there. And I think, you know, I'd probably use GetApp or Captera or G2 um, to try and figure out which ones to go with. Any off the top of your head that you're, you've been using lately, Andre? Um, well, we have clients uh, trying with Zoho, which um, I understood have done a very good job recently at um, improving the platform. And we use HubSpot, so um, we are probably looking to stick to them because they have the sales and marketing in the same place. Um, and they also have the chat, which we can implement on the, um, on the website. Um, I know that you are a fan of Drift, right? Yeah, and, and also I've, I've used Insightly. So I've definitely used a mix with different clients. So there's no standout one. I think that they're all, you know, depends on your budget, depends on your team size. I think Teamwork are doing some interesting work and they, they should be checked out as well where they are trying to integrate um, a lot of these. Um, so yeah, look, look, it's a matter of choice, but you know, start with a fairly entry-level one and use Zapier to kind of make sure it connects with the website and... Uh, make sure you're really clear on the different lead statuses and, and you don't want to have too many and you want a real clarity, you know, when does an MQL become an SQL? There's got to be no doubt or ambiguity about some of those elements. Very cool, Alan. Thanks a lot. So we discussed about the strategy. We discussed about how to approach that bit and assess whether you are in a good position to scale and double down on uh, inbound lead generation and investing your marketing budgets or you need to review where you stand. Uh, we discussed about the channels that you that, that a business in this space can look at and how to judge them and also, very important, how to attribute the leads that come through so that they are sure that they're investing their budgets in the area that or in the channel that generates the best return on investment. Uh, now I'm very, very, sh- and also we discussed about the um, tools and uh, tech that they can use to build a tech stack in the beginning. Now there's another thing that I'm sure that many of our listeners would be interested in and they probably uh, held to this point so that they can find out this. Uh, so let's go straight to that, that point, which is what are some uh, tips and tricks that you that you have discovered working in the in this space for such a long while and uh, maybe some things that you think would be good to look at for the future now that the market has been shifting a bit and uh, obviously with every downturn comes an opportunity as well yeah you know it all, all makes sense look a couple of ones one of the most simple things you can do which is the one that's often neglected is within google analytics there's an annotation button, right? So you can literally annotate um, every day. You should put in annotation what you did. Uh, why? Because when you get to three years of data and someone comes into marketing and they're trying to figure out why was there spikes or what was growing back then or why is it collapsed? You know, if you if you have annotations in there, you can literally click on the date and see what was happening. So it's an issue that you often happen because you often get marketing people last a year or 18 months. So in a three or five or seven year period, you've got all this data and you lose all the knowledge, you lose all the history. So you see that two years ago, your traffic was a lot higher. It's completely collapsed and you have no reason to understand. You can't figure it out, right? So, um, you know, if you can go back and look up annotations, you can see, oh, we were running in that period, we were running remarketing or in that period, we decided to test banner ads We put 10K in for the month, which has absolutely spiked everything and didn't work. So annotations in Google Analytics is a really key piece to kind of keep the history and keep the knowledge so that you can then benefit from it downstream. That's one. And prioritization is absolutely crucial. So you need a process and approach and and an ability to push back, right? So, you know, you need to be in charge of your own function. You can't have you know, everybody poking their head around the corner. Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do, because if you drop everything um, and are reactive to what other people are saying, you know, how then can you be accountable for um, leads, right? How can you be a bit like the webinar example, you know, that I mentioned earlier. If someone says you need to do a webinar and it's going to take 40 hours of your time, you need to, and it's going to mean that you can't do other things that were going to generate leads. You need to communicate that back. So that's kind of a key, key piece. Um, 
making sure you're using Google Search Console to index new content is something that's also worth remembering because people forget about it um, and they don't do it. So you really need a process once you publish content. Once you push content live, you need a process. There's essentially a 10-step process. Again, I'll share in the notes afterward. I've got an article that describes exactly what are the things you need to do when you produce content. Because again, what happens is people say, okay, we're going to do content. We know it's going to take a long time from an SEO point of view. They get someone junior doing it. They're writing less than 500 words. It's not very compelling. They write for a year. It doesn't move the needle because they didn't know that you need to do X, Y, and Z to really help. So, you know, indexing in Search Console would be an example. Internal links from the site back to this piece of content. Good URL structure, short URLs, copy being long enough, you know, all those things. So again, I'll send an article through, Andre, that you can have that um, outlines some of these. A speed test is crucial. So again, what I often see is people are cached locally, so they think their, their website's really fast. But for example, they might find that if you use Pingdom, and again, I can share this in the notes afterwards, Pingdom and you do a test from the US, the US could be a key market. Because when you look at most B2B SaaS, the US is the biggest market followed by UK, followed by countries. That's typically the case for most um, B2B SaaS companies. So UK and US are the key markets. There's no point being in Romania on a really fast connection because you're using a local host. If it's taking six seconds for your pages to download in the US because you're you know, you're not using a local host there, right? So that's kind of one that I would suggest um, is looked at. A couple of other quick ones. There's a company in the UK called Exposure Ninja. Um, and, you know, I, I think they're great. They offer um, a, a, an audit of your site, um, which they use Loom or something to record a 30 minutes overview or critique of your site for about £64. They have a free version and they've got a paid one for £64. But I think it's a really valuable thing to do, to send uh, the link to them, pay £64. I'm not sure what that is in, in euros or other currencies, but it's not that expensive. And you get a 30-minute video back telling you, video back saying you need to change this, or you need to change this, or you need to change this. So um, so there are some tips. Uber Suggest is another tool that's quite valuable. You can look at competitors as well as your own. You know, it's almost a beginner's tool before you want to jump into Ahrefs or ICMrush. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then the final piece is just use outsource people. You know, use people like yourself that are specialists in discrete areas because often you can't get the skills internally for someone that's going to be able to focus on all these different elements. So I'd argue that you've got to use um, things like growth mentor or you know, outsourced expertise to come in and, and, and critique what you're doing and, and offer alternative perspectives when you can. Mm -hmm. Super. Thanks a lot. And also uh, just to, um, to emphasize a bit more the strategy behind producing content subject that you mentioned. So uh, this is really, really crucial for you guys uh, if you run um, a business in this niche, uh, not because it's going to immediately drive uh, leads to you, but because with every day that passes, you are basically losing out first on the added uh, SEO benefits that you could be benefiting from uh, further down the line, which can save you loads of budgets when you think about Google Ads, for example. Um, and then also it can uh, amplify having a keyword strategy in the first place and, and an SEO strategy can amplify the, the effects of your content and you know what you do on that front because uh, you can produce great quality content if you don't apply those three, four, five um, tweaks to it so that you can make it work best for you and you don't have a strategy in mind of keywords that you want to highlight at specific points in the text like in uh, H1s or H2s or links then that content is going to be delivering maybe 10 times less traffic, relevant traffic than it could otherwise. All right, because a lot of the junior marketing people, again, just don't know any better, right? So they're told, can you write content? What they don't understand is, is that, you know, you know long form content is a lot more valuable than short form. Um, URL structure is important. Is the keyword in the URL? Is it in the H1? Is it in the body? Is the site index? Is the page index by Google Search Console as soon as it's pushed out? Have you got an amplification plan to push it through LinkedIn, to push it through Twitter, to push it in other channels in a newsletter? Because what unfortunately happens is people spend an awful lot of time creating content. And then when you look in Google Analytics, 
um, you find that there's just no traffic on that content. It's really, really low because what happens is most people stay on the home page. They might go to the about us or team page. That tends to be the second most popular, maybe onto some product pages. But unless you've got a promotion plan for that kind of content and blogs, you just get no traffic to it. It might mean better off pushing it on LinkedIn or guest blogging on, on relevant sites, but there are some other things to be aware of. And one last tip actually just for you to, to kind of share, right, is um, the other thing is to be aware, aware of you know, needing filters in Google Analytics, right? So if you just look at raw Google Analytics data and you think, wow, we've had 20,000 visitors this month, but actually, um, and that might tell you, wow, this is, you know, this is really growing. Um, and then your conversion rates look really awful. But then you find out, actually, there is, you, know, you need to filter out bot traffic. You need to filter out traffic from countries that you're not targeting. You might have a login button in the top right-hand corner, which everybody's coming back to the site to log in. You need to filter that out. You could have a number of people in your office that are constantly on the website. You filter that out. Um, you might have these other suspicious traffic that's staying for a second and, and leaving straight away. You filter that out. So what you end up finding, Andre, is your traffic is a much smaller portion of what you think the top level figure is. And when it's smaller, it means your conversion rates look a bit better, but it also then helps you understand whether I should be investing in the next tech stack. Because you know, if you're only getting a small number of users, your audience then is quite small. So then some of these other tools we talked about earlier, you know, you might not be ready for you. So, so like things like chat on your website. Well, if the reality of your site is that the chat numbers are really small, when you filter out all this other noise, then investing in chat and all that might be something you just wait for another year till the traffic is high enough. Mm -hmm. Very good insight. And actually, uh, using filters, I saw this. Um, I mean, you introduced me to to effectively using the filters in the first place, and I also thought. You know, like that's such a valuable thing that not many people were doing at that time. So thanks a lot for bringing this up, guys. I think you should definitely be doing this one. And I think it's going to change a lot your view on how your website is performing. And then subsequently, what pages are really bringing value to the people that are visiting them. So um, it's a really quick thing that you can do. Also, uh, to expand from this in Search Console as well. So uh, after you index your site, you'll be able to see the organic traffic and rankings and everything. Uh, but also make sure to use the country filters as well if you are interested in ranking specific demographics, because that's going to show you actually how you rank in specific markets and then going back to the cost effectiveness uh, subject or area then you might be um, looking at saving uh, i mean if you optimize correctly for specific countries for specific keywords then you can save up to uh, like ten dollars maybe more per click per keyword mainly in the tech uh, space some specific keywords like b2b sales and you know s s keywords like that uh, tend to be very very expensive so you can save yourself a very good amount of money um by optimizing correctly for specific yeah. keywords great point Andrea. Yeah. super okay so this was such a great discussion and i'm really really happy that we uh we got a chance to to do it thanks a lot alan for for your time and your input i know you are very busy these days so uh really appreciate it um one thing that we try to do with every episode is to draw some uh knowledge bullets, let's say. Uh, so some main points, actionable points, that people can go and apply them straight into the business uh, to see quantifiable results as well as to you know move forward. Uh, we already touched on some actionable subjects today, but if we were to wrap up and to summarize all that we discussed now into maybe three, four points, I know it's going to be hard, uh, <laughs> uh, that people can... Uh, takeaway and maybe they can do by the end of uh, the week or depending on when they listen to the podcast but let's say within the next week um what are some you know actionable things that they can do they can look at and they can maybe implement already into their business wow you're really putting me on the spot right so i think some prioritization you know we're kind of saying that everybody in marketing is just overwhelmed therefore there needs to be clear prioritization so a transparent approach that be it using trello or teamwork or base camp so that's definitely one and um, using Search Console, make sure you get indexed, that's a quick tip. Using Google Analytics to get your annotations in there, that pays off in the long run. It's painful now, but it's an extra step each day, but there's nothing worse than a new CMO coming in and having five years of data and having no idea why the traffic has collapsed in the last two years because the person that you know was running the marketing function three years ago 
um, you know, was doing stuff that you weren't aware of. So, um, and I think, look, it's it's um, you're managing upwards, right? It's it's being able to communicate effectively that uh, you know marketing needs to be in charge of its own function and destiny, and therefore, you know, we're always willing to help people in sales and have conversations with them. But you know, if you say to us, "Can you do a webinar in two weeks' time?" You know, we need to be able to be, be comfortable pushing back and being clear what's the purpose, what's the objective, is this going to generate SQLs or not? Because the last thing you want to do is is um, you know execute this that takes 20 to 40 hours to, to kind of build and get going and then find it doesn't translate to SQLs. And in the meantime, you've stopped doing other stuff that you could have been doing to bring in SQLs. So, you know, it's being confident of pushing back when you need to. Mm -hmm. Very good. Awesome. So um, summarizing now, I'm sure that our discussion raised a lot of questions to for, for many of the people listening. Um, and uh, we'll have the links in the description below as well. But if people want to uh, pick your brains a bit more, maybe have a discussion on specifically their business and uh, maybe they would want to explore this uh, with you further or maybe if you have time and you can help them uh, restructure their marketing or their marketing strategy, expand into, into new markets and so on, which is uh, your specialty, um, what would be the best way for them to, to get in touch with you? Via your website, via LinkedIn? Yeah, my website, workwithagility.com. So again, that will be in the show notes. So you get the link there. I'm also on Growth Mentor, which is a platform that helps businesses pro bono, whereby they get access to people like me for you know an hour for a conversation. So that's also worth checking out. So I've got a profile on there as well. Again, I'll share that with you, Andre, after the call. Sure. Perfect. Okay. Um, so Alan, thanks so much again for, for your input. It was great and lovely to have you here. Uh, looking forward to meeting up real time as well, hopefully soon. Um, and until next time, uh, wishing you the very best. Thanks again for all the input and thanks a lot for all of you guys tuning in today as well. It's been an amazing pleasure as always and looking forward to speaking again soon. Thanks, Andre. It's great talking to you and love the chat. So thanks for your time. Thank you as well.